We, uh, tonight's uh, Kabbalah decoded session is going to be a question and answer session. Um, a few people sent in prior to the, um, to the class sent in some uh, questions. Not everybody did. Um, if you want to send in a question now, that's also good. I'm not sure that I'll be able to get all answers tonight. You might have to take a rain check on some of them. Depends how long it takes to answer them. Uh, but I will try and get to at least the vast majority of them. Um, okay. Now, first of all, um, tonight's class is dedicated to Jorge Ramos. Not the one from Univision, but um, a relative of Gloria, Gloria de Canto, who um, is one of our regular participants. And she has dedicated this class to Jorge Ramos. So, thank you very much, Gloria. And um, I hope that um, whatever, whatever you wish for yourselves and for, um, for Jorge is only the best and will come into fruition. Okay, I'm going to just start with questions, uh, more or less in the order that I got them. And um, if you don't understand something, please type in the chat box, and I will uh, re-explain. So the first question I heard, I got was: I've heard years ago that this is not the first world that God created. Is that true? Yes, in fact, that is indeed correct. Now. When we say it's not the first world God created, what, is exa what exactly does that mean? There was another plane of reality. It wasn't a physical world as such, uh, not, a, not a physical world as we know it, but it was another plane of reality called the world of Tohu. I'm just going to type that in the chat box so you can see it. Tohu, or if you want it in Hebrew, it is Tohu, right? The world of Tohu. And it says about the world of Tohu, that it was created in order to be destroyed and destroyed in order to be recreated. Now, that sounds a little complicated, and uh, to a certain extent it is. But the basic idea is this. God created a world in which there was a tremendous, tremendous revelation of godliness in that world, the world of Tohu. The way it's expressed in Kabbalah is as follows. Creation or existence consists of an animating life force and that which contains the life force. Or in the language of the Kabbalah, it's called the light and the vessel. The animating life force and that which it animates, the body, so to speak. Now, prior to um, um, the creation of the planes of reality, which we've discussed many times in, uh, in these classes, from the world of Atsilut and downwards, there's for there are four planes of reality primar primarily that we're talking about, called the world of Atsilut, the world of closeness, the world of creation, Bria, the world of formation, Yetzira, and the world of action, Asiya, which the lowest aspect of that is our physical world. But prior to all of those four worlds that I just described was another world called the world of Anam Kadmon. And out of this world of Adam Kadmon, one of the aspects of Adam Kadmon was a form of creation called the world of Tohu that I just mentioned. Now that world of Tohu um, was, was, was um, imbued with a level of energy that simply could not be contained, so there was, so to speak, a breakdown the vessels shattered and then they were reabsorbed in the later forms of creation in the later four worlds that we spoke about, Atsilut, Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya, and um, the higher the sparks, as they're called, the, the, the higher they were, were absorbed, in other words, they were absorbed in a higher world, a higher plane of reality, until the lowest sparks fell down to this world. Now we have to recreate or reattach those sparks to their source by fulfilling the commandments of the Torah, by praying with intention, 
and with, uh, with awareness and uh, by doing uh, good deeds in, uh, in the world and by learning Torah and particularly by learning Kabbalah that restores the creation. The, I re restores the creation, sorry, it restores the shattered world of Tohu. Tohu sometimes is translated as chaos, the world of chaos. So that was a former type of creation that was started over again. Now this relates to another question. Um, I'm just going to mark off this question as done. Um, okay. So there was another question that's sort of related to this, uh, and that is why were we created from God's perspective? Why were we created from God's perspective? Well, that is exactly um, the primary question that a person should be asking himself. Why am I here? What am I created for? Now, each individual, each person, was created for his own particular purpose. Now, let me explain here that there, I'm going to talk of things in a general sense and a specific sense. The reason for your particular existence is not what we're going to talk about now, because that's a process of discovery which each person has to make for himself, perhaps with guidance. Um, and uh, perhaps the person doesn't even, even need guidance. Perhaps it's clear to that person already. And, um, you know, in that case, um, what you were created for, if that's clear to you, then, uh, then that's fantastic. For most of us, it's a journey throughout our lives to find out what it is that we're created for. But in a general sense, as far as humanity, what was mankind created for? Primarily, we were created for, according to the way the Midrash, the Midrash explains, the Midrash is a rabbinic literature which um, has a lot of sort of philosophical ideas, it presents philosophical ideas and, um, and very often as explanations of various verses in the Torah and in the writings of the Prophets. But the Midrash says that the reason that we're created is because God wanted a dwelling place in the lower worlds. In fact, not in the lower worlds, but in the lower world primarily. What does that mean? In the higher worlds, the higher planes of reality, which are called worlds in Kabbalah, in the higher planes of reality, godliness is revealed. As we said before, the world of Tohu, godliness was so revealed that the world couldn't withstand the revelation and shattered with intention. It was intentionally made that way. But the lower worlds, there's a much, there's a much more, a much greater concealment of God, of godliness. The higher the world, the more godliness is revealed. The lower the world, the more godliness is concealed. In fact, the word world in Hebrew comes from the word olam. Oh, and someone asked me if I'm recording. Yes, I am. <laughs> I am recording, yes. Um, the word olam, I'm writing it again in the chat box, olam, Hebrew, olam, means, it's translated as world, but it really means, it comes from the word he'elem, he'elem means concealment. So, in other words, the more... God is concealed, the more olam it becomes, the more world it becomes, the more worldly, let's call it. So, what God wanted was, not that he should be revealed in the higher worlds, which he is, but he should be revealed equally in the lower worlds, in the place where he's not revealed. But not that he should bring about that revelation, but that we should bring about that revelation. The inhabitants of that lowest world, us in other words, have to make that world into a place which is, in which godliness is revealed. It's a fitting place for godliness. The expression in the Midrash is, God desired a dwelling place in the lower worlds. So, that was the reason for creation. Within that structure, within that 
dynamic of God wanting his godliness to be revealed in the world by human beings, each and every one of us has our part. And in fact, our unique part. How we are going to reveal godliness in that world, in this world, that nobody else could do it in exactly the same way. Because if someone else can do it in the same way, then you wouldn't be necessary, or he or she wouldn't be necessary. One of you would not be necessary. Therefore, each person is unique from that point of view. All right? I hope that answers that question. Okay. Uh, there's a question here about dinosaurs. How did dinosaurs live before man if the earth was created? Biblically, according to the Bible, the earth was created only uh, less than 6,000 years ago, 5,776 years ago. Um, it is still possible that dinosaurs lived before man, that there were dinosaurs. Uh, in fact, the Torah also talks about hataninim hagdolim, these huge creatures. They're called, it's called a tanin, and usually the Hebrew translation, the modern Hebrew translation of the word tanin is a dinosaur. Usually more sort of a reptilian type of, uh, um, type of dinosaur, but nevertheless dinosaurs. And all of those creatures um, were killed in the flood, according to uh, those who explain this, explain the Torah literally. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. It was, uh, they were, they were, they, they died in the flood. They were these kinds of creatures. And they lived before the, uh, before the flood. They drowned during the great flood, as spoken about in the time of Noah's Ark. Um, so we're asking about how the earth was created 6,000 6, years ago. I'd, just, I'd like to give you an analogy. Uh, you could also ask a similar question, why is it that in previous, uh, in early, early times, early biblical times, the Torah talks about the age of people being 900, 800, 700, and so on and so forth. It's only really from, from Abraham onwards that ages started to get more or less in the, in the realm of normal, 175, 180. From the time of Moses, 120. Moses was 120. After that, it was uh, less than that. Now, I will give you an explanation by way of an analogy. Now, you know, when you bounce a ball, when you throw it, let's say you're standing on a, um, um, you're standing on a balcony somewhere and you drop a ball down into the courtyard, let's say one of these super balls, you know, super rubber balls or whatever it is that bounce all the way, almost all the way back up to where they came from, right? Now, just imagine you drop that ball and the ball bounces, it bounces, it hits the ground, and then uh, bounces up again, and then it hits the ground, and bounces up again, and hits the ground, and bounces up again, and it makes sort of a, um, uh, makes a pattern of bounces, but each bounce gets consecutively smaller, right? Until the ball almost uh, comes to rest or just rolls along, right? I mean, everybody's seen this, it's not, it's not difficult to, to picture, to imagine. Now, just think for a minute that this idea is actually a way also of defining time. Let me explain what I mean. Um, time in Kabbalah is formed by a constant flux of energy. Let me explain further. When energy comes into the universe, when energy comes into the system, the system doesn't have any energy of its own, right? The vessel doesn't have any light of its own, or the vessels, if you want to put it that way. But let's just take it as one vessel. The vessel doesn't have any light of its own. It has to be imbued with light. The body doesn't have any life force of its own. It has to be imbued with life force. Now, that life force doesn't come in in a stream. It comes in in a pulse, it pulses. The life force is always pulsing. It's pulsing into the system, circulating around it, and returning. Very much like the blood in a human being. In fact, this is one of the analogies. In one of the first classes, I think possibly the first class that we ever gave in this series, um, I spoke about this, and perhaps I should uh, discuss it again, but the whole concept of time is based on the pulsing of the life force. 
Now, the pulsing of the life force, if you feel your pulse, if you just put your finger on your pulse for a minute or you feel your heartbeat for a minute, you can feel that your pulse is not in a constant state of, um, of, of expansion. It sort of expands, contracting, expands, con expands, contracts, expands, contracts, etc., etc. In other words, a little gap between them, right? Between each beat, which is a beat of your heart, between each beat, there is a pause. So says Kabbalah, that's what defines time. That the same thing happens as it happens on a, in the microcosmic scale in your own pulse. It also happens in the universe as a whole. In all the spiritual universes, the life force comes into them as a pulsing force, right? Like a heartbeat. The heartbeat is regulated by the brain. The brain itself doesn't beat, but the heart beats. Similarly, the universe, the energy of the universe is sort of pumped around and it's very much like a heartbeat. Between one beat and the next is a gap. That gap defines time. That gap between one beat and the next defines a moment in time. Now, to go back to our analogy about the bouncing ball, when you first drop the ball, the ball recoils and returns almost to the point at which you dropped it the point from which you dropped it. And then the next time the ball bounces, it bounces back, but a little, a few inches lower. And then again, a few inches lower, and then again, a few inches lower, a few inches lower, until it's just rolling along the ground and comes to a stop. Similarly, the life force was just like that initially, that it pulsed into the system and returned, and then there was a gap. But that gap was much longer than the gap that we have now. So therefore, time passed much more slowly. That gap was like the first and the second and the third bounce of the ball. But as time goes on, the bounces get shorter and time seems to speed up. And in fact, everyone can feel <laughs> these days, I think you probably, I know, probably feel that uh, that time is speeding up. I mean, uh, you know, it was just um, it was just Sunday yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> In fact, it was last Sunday yesterday. I mean, time is really speeding up, and time flies, and uh, and uh, you know, the the feeling that we get is actually truth. Things are speeding up. Time is speeding up. Therefore, when we talk about time, the way we measure it now, we measure it according to that gap, even though science doesn't necessarily measure it that way. But that's how we measure. That's how we measure time in the Torah. So now, since time in the Torah was much longer in previous eras, so the fact that only if we would measure it according to current times, it would only be 6,000 years, it's possible to measure it in other time scales, in the longer, much longer time scales, more than 6,000 years, although we count it as only 6,000 years because we count it according to our times. That's another explanation. There's others as well. Um, yes, Yael, that is the concept of Rata Vashov. And uh, yeah, I, so, I, so I will, uh, God willing, do a lecture on the concept of time um, sometime in the future. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a question about Lilith, Adam's first wife. She wasn't actually his first wife, his second wife, really. But So there's a concept spoken about in the Zohar that Adam, after the sin, had another wife, like a, um, um, an unofficial wife, a mistress called Lilith. But basically, what that means is, rather than Eve, yes? Basically, what that means is it's not the Zohar doesn't doesn't want to imply. I think anyway, the Zohar is not implying that Lilith was necessarily um, a living creature. It's not Lilith is a principle, just like the Satan is a principle, the Satan is a principle. Lilith is, so to speak. I mean, if you if you if you take these these things literally. 
Lilith is the wife of Satan, so to speak. What does it mean? It just means it's the female aspect, the feminine aspect of the 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 the, the impulse to self destruction. The Satan is the impulse to self destruction. Lilith is the feminine aspect of that. What's the feminine aspect? There's an active aspect and there's a passive aspect, or rather, an active aspect and a um, a receptive aspect. And sometimes that receptivity, a person becomes ma becomes married, so to speak, to the res to the receptive aspect of the impulse to self-destruction. There's an active impulse to self-destruction, which, God forbid, could land up in things like uh, suicide. And then there's a, a, a negative aspect to it, or a, a rather a, a receptive or the female aspect, as it's called, the feminine, doing things which eventually will lead to a person's death, although indirectly. It's not an action as such. It could be um, ways of thinking, ways of behaving, ways of um, of uh, living. In any event, that's was that's the concept of Lilith. Now, the word Lilith in Hebrew would be spelt like this: spelt Lilith, L I L I T H, uh, not two T's, one Lilith or Lilith in Hebrew. Lilith, and the most important part of this is Li. Li Li. Li Li means to me, to me, or for me, for me. In other words, it's that egocentric aspect of a person's existence that is called Li Lit. It's the ongoing egocentricity, which is destructive. And let's leave it at that. I'd rather not talk about such negative things, but um, uh, let's let's move on from here. I hope that answers the question, though. Okay. Uh, someone said they're curious to know about crossing the barrier. How will you know if you cross the barrier? Can I expand on the subject, or if there is such a thing? Um, yes, there is such a thing. Um, now, I'll explain it like this. Between each between each world and the next one, between one world and the next one, there is a, barri uh, a barrier which prevents, essentially prevents uh, a person from, or prevents passage from one world to a higher world, from one plane of reality to a higher plane of reality, if one doesn't know how to cross that barrier. Now, we read um, last week, in the Torah, about the story about uh, Lavan and Yaakov, Laban and Jacob, and they came to an agreement that they would place between where Jacob would be and where Lavan would be, uh, Laban would be, they placed a pile of stones, which is called yeah, Yegar Sahadusa or Gal Eid. Gal Eid is the Hebrew name, Yegar Sahadusa is the Aramaic name, or the Aramean name. Now, this um, this pile of stones in Kabbalah actually represents the barrier between holiness and that which is not holy. Not that which is unholy, but that which is not holy. It's called Klipat Noga. Uh, klipat Noga. Klipat Noga means the shell which is somewhat luminous. Generally, the shells, what I call the shells, are uh, it's, it's terminology which defines or um, uh, describes negative energy. It describes uh, unholiness. But there's one shell which is somewhat luminous. It has some light in it. Some, it's not completely opaque. It's somewhat translucent. And that's what's called klipat noga. Noga means to shine. So, that, uh, that aspect of Klippot and Klippat Noga is, again, it's not unholiness, but it's not holiness either. 
So Jacob and, and Laban made an agreement that this pile of stones would, would, would this barrier, this pile of stones, would uh, be the sign that you were like the border crossing, right? That you were crossing from the border of holiness into that which is not yet holy. And they agreed that they wouldn't cross over other than for business. Now says the Kabbalah, what kind of business is that? That's the business of rectifying the sparks of holiness which are buried in creation. So for that you can cross the barrier to go to a lower level. Normally, we're trying to cross the barrier to go to a higher level. But there's not just one barrier, there's many barriers. There's a barrier between Klippat and Noga and, and holiness, the world of Asiya. And then between the world of Asiya and the world of Yetzirah, there's another barrier. And between the world of Yetzirah and the world of Bria, there's another barrier. Between Bria and Atsilus, there's another barrier. Between Atsilus and Anokano, another barrier. And within the worlds themselves, there's also some minor barriers between the emotional qualities and the intellectual qualities, there's also somewhat of a barrier. Um, and we are trying to traverse this barrier. Some find it easier than others. Um, there were, the Baal Shem Tov says about the Or HaChaim HaKadosh. The Or HaChaim is one of the commentaries on the Torah. And he was the great tzaddik before the time of the Baal Shem Tov, before the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, he wrote a commentary on the Torah, very, very interesting person, Rabbi Chaim uh, ben Atar. He's buried in Israel, in Jerusalem. And the Baal Shem Tov said about him that he was very light-footed. He could traverse from one world to the next with a skip and a hop and a jump. It was very easy for him to go from one level to the next, he hardly had to put in any effort. He was light-footed. <laughs> um, so, okay, I hope that answers that question. Um, what, uh, next question, what are the different methods of the different rabbis' approach, approaches? Now, I'm not sure exactly what uh, rabbis you're referring to. Um, if you're referring only to the rabbis of the Kabbalah, or if you're referring to in general, um, I'm going to assume that you're referring to the rabbis of the Kabbalah. In, uh, in the non-Kabbalistic world of Torah, in the, 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 there are people who do not study Kabbalah, unfortunately, for them. Uh, they don't just, uh, 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 learn Kabbalah maybe until much later in life, but in any event, there are such people. And they also have their approaches. There's uh, several different approaches over there. But within Kabbalah, there are two primary approaches. The first approach, which is, we could call pure Kabbalah or standard Kabbalah, if you prefer, is the approach of bringing down very, very lofty um, ideas which really represent um, know, vehicles for very lofty lights, so to speak, down into this world through clothing them in various um, conceptual vehicles. Now, I know what I just said makes no sense whatsoever. Let, let me just put it like this. Let's say a person is meditating. What's the technique of his meditation? Is the technique of his meditation to attempt to feel, to, to sort of, um, to feel godliness and to bring it down from level to level, to understand it at the highest level and then attempt to sort of put clothes on it, intellectual clothing on it, conceptual clothing on it in order to be able to understand it better. Now that's really the way the Svirot in a sense work. They work from the flash of insight, the flash of energy going, starting up right at Keter and flashing into Chochmah and then going around the system of the Svirot all the way down through the uh, uh, final Svira which is called Malchut. So Kabbalistic meditation and methodology uses this approach. It's called, uh, technically speaking, it's called Milamala Lamata. Let me just... Now, Milamala Lamata, 
means from above to below. Whereas there is another methodology, and this is methodology primarily of the much later Kabbalah, and primarily the methodology of the Baal Shem Tov and those who followed in his footsteps, which is called Mi Le Mi Le Mata Le Ma'ala. Mi Le Mata Le Ma'ala, which means from below to above. Taking the things of this world and stripping them of their coarse physicality in order to get to the inner core of godliness within them. That's the methodology of Hasidic Kabbalah. Now, the methodology of um, the pure Kabbalah, or if you would like to call it the older Kabbalah, has its dangers. It has a danger that you might bring down a level of light for which you don't have a vessel, just like the world of Tohu that we explained before, and then things could break apart, they could shatter, they could cause, it could cause a certain amount of um, instability. Unhealthiness in the person's outlook or instability perhaps in, uh, could, be, could even lead to, it can lead to mental, mental instability and so on and so forth. However, the, the method of the Baal Shem Tov doesn't have that, um, that difficulty, that problem. Why? Because you can only get up to the next level related to the barriers that we were talking about before. We can only get up to the next level by being worthy of it. You can't climb up the ladder until you have the energy to do so. You can't get through the barrier until you have the energy to do so. So instead of forcing lights down into vessels which might not be ready or might not be clear, clean, sufficiently clean, so to speak, pure, for the, um, for the light, it goes the opposite way. Cleanse the vessel and automatically the light becomes revealed and then cleanse it further and more light becomes, and so on and so forth. In other words, milamata from below to above. Um, Yael asks, um, did that happen with the four who went into the Garden of Eden and only one came out? Essentially, that is what it was, right? That is what it was. It was uh, certainly Ben Azai and Ben Zoma were in that uh, situation. And Acher as well, yes. The only one that went in and came out was Rabbi Akiva. He went in in peace and he came out in peace. In other words, he arose to the world of, uh, to, to the higher world because he was worthy and then he was able to come back because he was worthy. Uh, so uh, the follow-up to this question was, and what is my method? My method is that one. That's exactly the method that I use from below to above. It's worth um, noting that um, the below to above methodology is um, equally powerful uh, without having the without having the uh, the disadvantages of the other one. The other one, one can use certain very um, let's call them uh, very powerful instruments to break through the locks so to speak. But when you break through the locks, um, you know, you might get the police coming after you, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and therefore, it's not, it's not worth breaking through the locks using the power of holy names and the power of certain meditations. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's unwise and it's unhealthy. So the Baal Shem Tov devised this method of going from below to above, which doesn't have any of these... Um, disadvantages. Okay, hope that answers that one. Um, now, let me see here. Next question. Next question is, why do men and women study separately, and is that the future of Kabbalah? Um, in general, men and women uh, pray separately in the Orthodox, in the Orthodox tradition. 
and they study separately as well, although this is not necessarily the case. They just sit separately. And the reason for that is simply distractions. Um, when one is studying the Word of God, you don't want sort of, um, you know, all kinds of um, unwanted and unrelated thoughts running through one's mind, um, which can often happen when men and women are sitting together, even if they've been married for many years. But in any event, that's the way to do it. Not only that, but um, there is also a different approach to the way men study men. Uh, you know, and this might not be politically correct, um, but you'll excuse me if I'm not politically correct. Uh, <laughs> frankly, I don't give a hoot. Um, <laughs> um, men and women approach things differently. Um, doesn't mean to say that women are inferior, they're not. They have a much more intuitive grasp of things and much more in tune with the emotional grasp of things. Men generally have a much more sort of logical and, um, let's put it, serial way of understanding. Women have a much more, um, men think in serial form and women think in parallel form. That's why they're so much better at multitasking than men are, generally. Now, I'm making generalizations here, obviously. I'm not talking about any particular individual, but that is true. Uh, men are serial actors, and women are parallel um, processors. Men are serial processors. That's why women can do things very often much faster than men can, because they process in parallel. But it's just a different way that the mind works and a different way men and women operate. Um, you know, the Y chromosomes and the X chromosomes are different. And they have different um, um, influences on how a person works altogether. Uh, you know, those chemical reactions just happen differently. It doesn't mean to say that there are women are, who are not just as smart as men are. It doesn't mean to say that they're not men who are just as intuitive as women are. We're talking in a general sense. And therefore, um, in order to accommodate each group according to the best way of study, the best method of study, so it's preferable to study it separately besides the reasons that I mentioned uh, in the beginning. Is that the future of Kabbalah? Well, not necessarily. I mean, my wife and I, for example, study uh, Kabbalah together, um, generally on a, you know, Saturday morning early, uh, Shabbos morning, we study some Kabbalah together. Um, but when we talk about in groups, so in groups it's usually not done like that. In groups it's usually done as a more, um, um, you know, separated two separate two separate groups because again the approaches are different. Okay, next question: Is there a place where a person dwells in advanced stages, like in an upper world, where a person in this sphere could receive greater bestowal by just keeping walking forward? Does there always have to be to adjusted will or correction? Um, yeah, I read this question earlier, and I wasn't sure that I really understood it clearly. Um, when a person is in an advanced stage of spiritual development, uh, yes, uh, he is living in a higher world. He might be living in this world as well, uh, hopefully he is uh, living in this world as well, but sees things from a different perspective, you know, um, very great people, as we know, sort of seem to have this sort of helicopter view of everything. They can see it from above. They can see it from a, from a whole different perspective. Rather than just being sort of buried in it, they tend to be able to detach themselves from it and see it from a much higher, from their spiritual point of view. Um, and um, yes, I mean, that's, that, that, that is no question about it, that that, uh, that, that is true. And can you reach it by just walking forward, if I'm understanding you correctly? Yeah, you continue going forward. And um, sometimes just walking forward doesn't help. One needs to leap forward or leap upwards. Um, but um, 
you know, you'll know when that, uh, when that generally you'll know when that is the case. You'll know when you come to um, a point at which now I feel that um, I have to jump to the other side. I have to jump, make a quantum leap. And it's, um, it doesn't happen to everybody, but it does uh, generally happen to most people <coughs> sometime, some point in life. Uh -huh. um, no, 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 you're not required to send in uh, questions before the class, um, just, if you're sending questions before, I'm just taking them more or less in order, so those people that sent in earlier <laughs> get their answers earlier, um, but no, you don't have to have sent them in, that's not a problem. Um, is there a place where evil intent is complete? Yeah, I mean, uh, is a place where rectification is complete? Yes. Um, where only purpose remains. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but when a person is living his purpose, the purpose for which he was created, the purpose for which he's here, then generally that is a person, that is a place of, for that person, a place of rectification. That is the rectification. Um, okay, let me just go a little bit further. In the process of creation, Esau was higher, in the purpose of creation, Jacob was higher, correct. Does that happen because of choice? That is correct. In the process of creation, Esau was higher, he came first, he was the firstborn. But in the purpose of creation, Jacob was higher in the sense that he was, um, He was the one who carried, the, who bore the standard, uh, carried the standard of what it means to be a godly person in the world. Did Esau have that choice? He had that choice, but um, for whatever reason was not able to take it. Did he have more advantages in being high in the process? He had advantages, sure, but he didn't use them. You know, you will find, um, I was just actually watching a TED talk yesterday interesting TED talk. Uh, this woman was talking about, she happens to be the CEO of a corporation. And uh, she was talking about like uh, hiring practices and who would you hire? Would you hire the Harvard graduate with a four point average and a perfect resume? Or would you hire a person who had done all kinds of uh, things in their, life and in their lives and obviously been through uh, a, a, you know, a long process of, um, of discovering who they were and being in all types of different situations, including being a singing waitress and various other things, who would you hire? So the normal person would say, well, you know, the Harvard grad with, uh, with a four point average has got a perfect resume. And, they, and she said, well, if you would have done that, then I would have not been employed. Uh, and she got to the position that she got to because someone saw within her potential that, she did, that they didn't see in a Harvard grad. The fact that she was able to struggle through, to get through her struggles and persevere and eventually succeed. Jacob had troubles, he had issues, he had, he had his own issues, he had difficulties that he had to deal with. And God says to him eventually when he succeeds, he says, you struggled with man and God and you succeeded. You struggled with your fellow human beings, you struggled with yourself. You struggled with divine providence the way it came out for you and you overcame. And that's why Jake was actually higher in the end, because that was his choice. He went through the struggle. Esau was not prepared to go through the struggle. He didn't want it. If you don't give me my, uh, my um, uh, gold-plated job, I'm going to go in the corner and sulk, <laughs> kind of thing. Yes. In the, in the scheme of the universal plan, what does that mean? It means that... Um, the universal plan for us that God wants us not to get what is called the bread of shame. The bread of shame is free handouts. Um, what do they call it here? To be on welfare. Now, God forbid I'm not saying that there's some people that, you know, have been through terrible crises and tragedies and they're on welfare, and that's fine. Uh, I have no, uh, and there's some people that are on welfare because of, uh, 
you know, they were, uh, they gave up their life and limb almost for, uh, you know, for, for the country and veterans and things like that. I don't talk about those people. I'm talking about freeloaders, right? The freeloaders who just live off the system, and believe me, there's millions of them, who live off the system and don't care to do a day's work because uh, you're going to get it, you know, easier and cheaper, uh, easier and, and, and more plentifully uh, by freeloading. So in the ver you know what what is that how does that translate to what we mean in the ver universal scheme of things in the uver universal plan God wants us to do the work He doesn't want to give us bread the bread of shame the free handout you work for what you get and then it is worthwhile because it was what you achieved. It's not just sort of hand-me-downs from uh, somebody else's hard work. Okay. Um, so there was a question about that class where I said that Esau was not willing to receive from Jacob initially. And I said that it was not the gift that was important, but the giving and receiving. Even though the gift was a huge gift, an enormous gift, he gave him enormous wealth. So what was the gift that he gave him? And can I elaborate on that? It was not sheep and goats. That's correct. It was not sheep and goats. The gift that was given to Esau um, was the understanding that he had hope, that he had a chance. How do we know? Because Jacob, Jacob um, says to him, I'll see you in Mount Seir. In other words, we'll meet again. I will see you in Mount Seir means that you have a future. I'm going to see you later on. And um, it's explained that that is really in the future, in the time to come, Esau will be redeemed. He will have either redeemed himself or will he, he will have been redeemed by Jacob will redeem him. He will, he'll come to some kind of redemption. And that was the gift that Jacob gave him, that the, he has a way out. He has a way forward. In the Mashiach, yes. In the messianic era and that was the gift that he gave him um, we're getting on in time so I'm going to try and um, let me answer two more questions here that I got if anyone has their question better type it in quick um, Uh, let's see, where was this question? Terry said, how, and how no matter how high a bird may soar, it seeks its food on earth, correct? Um, isn't Jacob to serve and lift Esau? Yes, he does. He does, he does lift him up by giving him hope there for the future. Um, Sent yours at the beginning of the class. Um, I don't see a clear question here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, why was Jacob? Oh, this went all the way back. Sorry. Um, why, uh, all right, so there's a question here that I missed. Um, why bother creating the worlds at all? It seems like a lot of effort. Just it could be revealed in the lower world. Why would he want that? Um, we don't know. Um, it is... Um, we don't know why God wants things. Uh, it's what's called a taiva. It's just a desire that he has, and uh, we can't answer why. What it is that he wants, we know, but why it is that he wants, it only he knows. Uh, so this was the question here. Why was Jacob was from the world of Tikkun chosen to be the father of 12 tribes versus Esau was from the world of Tolu not chosen? Um, well, the 12, 12 tribes really represent the 12 permutations of the divine name Yudke Vavke. And Esau was not, um, had no, he had no relevance to that name at all. He was not, um, he, he had no, um, 
how should we say the word in Hebrew shaychut? I can't think of it. I can't think of the word. He had no connection with it at all. He had no connection with that, and therefore would not. Um, he wouldn't be able to. He wouldn't have been able to to do the to do that work at all. It would have it would have completely destroyed him. In fact, that work would have destroyed him, um, and therefore he was not worthy of being the. Um, the author of the, uh, the father of the 12 uh, tribes. Uh, your question is really, since he was from a higher source, yeah, but it was, it was a higher source, but again, it was a higher source that for which there was no, uh, there was no work involved. There was no, there was nothing to be done because it shattered. The only thing to do is to rebuild. And since he was the one that was shattered, someone else has to do the rebuilding, which is us. And that's why Jacob's seed was chosen as the ones who do the rebuilding. And, of course, anybody can, uh, can be part of that. Um, there was another question about um, existential dissatisfaction, I think it was. Uh, existential dissatisfaction. Why is it even that we have many material things and spiritual things, there's always some yearning and sensation of lack um, yeah, oh, so uh, Gloria is saying over here that uh, Jorge passed away three days ago, I see. Yeah, he passed away three days ago. And this class is dedicated for the peace of his soul. Um, yes. Why is that? Why is that there's some existential dissatisfaction? Because if there wouldn't be, we would never grow. It would be, uh, you know, like uh, like a ripe fruit that just drops off the tree and that's it. It doesn't want to grow anymore. The tree itself continues growing, but the fruit doesn't. Um, and that's the reason I think God implants this existential dissatisfaction within us, so that we have a sense of yearning and a sense and 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 a sensation of lack of something, and we're looking for that something. Um, The the the, the, um, the the need that we have to look for something greater is in fact a gift. The worst thing that a person can can have is complacency. Well, there are probably worse things than that, but let's put it this way: the worst thing for a person's personal growth is complacency. You know, good enough. I don't have to do any better. You know, I'm okay. Uh, now let me sit in front of the TV and drink a beer and watch uh, sports. Uh, now I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that ever, but if that's a person's entire ambition in life, I think he would need a uh, sense of existential dissatisfaction to wake him up. <laughs> Hope that answers that. Um, Only place I found in the Hebrew lexicon is Screech Owl. Wow, I'm not sure what you're talking about at all. Alan, I'm sorry. Um, oh, Lilith? <laughs> really? Screech Owl, could be. Um, yeah, but it wouldn't be a word in the dictionary. It's sort of a religious concept. So, um, Would it be, 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 be better to have men and women together to get a fuller picture of Kabbalah and its meaning and depth? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with sharing, but um, in terms of um, in terms of studying Kabbalah, it's usually um, you know a study partner. I mean, as I said before, I do study with my wife, but uh, and here we have a mixed group, but. Um, it's just generally the way that things are done is you know, you go according to the general mindset. Uh, men like to approach this one way, women like to approach this another way, in general. Um, again, it's not necessarily the case with each individual, but that's just a general way of... Um... Okay, I hope that answered that question. Um, what about Gehenna? Uh, yeah, there was a question that came in about heaven and hell or Gan Eden and Gehenna. So there was a couple of questions about that. Um, now, are heaven and hell geographical uh, places? No, they are not. Heaven and hell are states of being. 
Um, in last week's Torah reading, we read about the uh, when Jacob went in to get the blessings, and then Esau afterwards came in. So when uh, Jacob went in to get the blessings, uh, his father, not knowing that it was Jacob, but um, sensing that it was, said, See, the scent of my son is like the scent of the Garden of Eden, the scent of a field which the Lord has blessed, which God has blessed, which the commentaries explain means the Garden of Eden. What does that mean? It means that that's where Jacob was spiritually. He was in the Garden of Eden. That's where he was. And that could be sensed by someone as sensitive as his father, Isaac, Yitzchak. When Esau comes in, it says, Isaac started trembling exceedingly when he, when, when he, when, when he heard Esau, he heard Esau come in because he sensed that was Esau came in, the uh, Gehenna, Gehenna is uh, the word that's usually tra translated as hell, that spiritual state of tremendous negativity came in with him. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, <clears throat> um, so that spiritual state of negativity, which we call hell or Gehenna, that's a spiritual state. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a place. It's a spiritual state. Now, there are those that say, <clears throat> uh, those who are familiar with him, that a person like Charles Manson, you know, Charles Manson, the serial killer, the murderer, cult leader, <clears throat> They say that he had this like magnetic negative pull. The person was Gehenna. That was that's where he was. He was like he had that negative energy of uh, of hell. But you know, I, I mean, since Dante, I suppose people sort of imagine hell and heaven as you know, uh, their hell is uh, you know. Um, some kind of uh, macro oven with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> people are roasting and being turned over by, uh, you know, little men with, uh, with, uh, with forks and the middle men are red and have forked tails and whatever it is and they have these pitchforks and so Come on. <laughs> that's, you know, that's just Dante. That was sort of, you know, just imagine. We talk about a spiritual level of spiritual self-destruction that is so powerful that it affects others. It affects others, and uh, and Ganadin is also powerful like that. If everyone ever was ever near a tzaddik, like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, you felt this when you just saw him. You felt this like uplifting. You felt uplifted. It was just a remarkable thing. You just came to his presence. You felt uplifted. You felt like positive about everything. You felt uplifted and 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 capable of doing anything, basically. <laughs> That's the, um, uh, okay. So that's about Gehenna. Uh, men and women, I think I answered the question, if I'm not mistaken, Annie. Um, um, that question about whether men and women can learn together and it would be more beneficial, it could be. It could be, it, you know, again, it depends on the, it depends on the, um, on the participants. Usually it's not done that way, but... It's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily wrong per se. Uh, so let's say you're going. Okay, what then happens? How long? How long would a person be in Gehenna? It is according to our tradition, except for very few souls, um, a person is in Gehenna for maximum one year and usually less than that. So in other words, the suffering that the soul suffers and is not can't depart from the body completely because it's encumbered by this negative energy usually only lasts for a year. Some people are exceptions if they're exceptionally evil in their lives, but um, generally only for a year. Most people for less than a year, 11 months. Uh, Yael is asking, is this true of all souls from to Tohu? Is what true of all souls? I, I, I'm not sure that I pick up the thread. Is what true? Um, just type it in the chat what you meant. Is this true of all souls from Tohu? Uh, While well, you're typing it in, if you are, so someone asked about what I thought of uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' opinion regarding refugees. 
I replied to that uh, privately. <laughs> I think he's nuts, frankly. And I don't say that lightly. I think Rabbi Sachs is a remarkable, remarkable mind, a remarkable person. And um, I don't say lightly that I think he's crazy. In this particular thing, I think he's crazy. Uh, I, you know, you see what's going on, and you can't. Yes, one has to have sympathy for people, refugees, build them a safe place, arrange safe place uh, in the countries of origin or in the Arab countries where they're with their people, they're with their culture, they're with their atmosphere and uh, what they're used to and so on and so forth. You know, transplanting people who are, you know, completely have no understanding of Western culture in a decaying Western culture is not a great idea. It's a recipe for disaster. Um, quite frankly. All right. Seems to be that we've come to the end of the questions, unless somebody has another one. Um, so, thank you all, and have a great Shabbos. And uh, for those of you who celebrate uh, Thanksgiving, I'm sure you'll uh, have a nice day tomorrow and enjoy yourselves. All the best. Shabbat shalom.